and Matt really needs no introduction. Um, obviously, a, a, a very and had a very good run here with Rawls Mini. Um, I think really, what's really been cool for me is been able to sort of spend some time with him uh, with the Harbor 19s um, teams. Um, so, you know, we're going to give him a chance to uh, to really dive into his philosophy. Thanks, Matt, for joining. Anything you want to say before we start? Um, no, I guess just like like you said, Vince, this is um, it's actually a bit it's a bit weird to like talk about yourself and what you've you've done or do and um, yeah, I suppose it's just um, I'm definitely no expert and I'm definitely no um, shining light at all. Um, but it is, I guess, if if anything, if we can spark some conversation and just have a little bit of back and forth around what I do and what you know everyone else on this chat does, um, and if there's some you know if there's some learnings, and I guess that's the goal, right? Yeah, that's perfect. So um, I guess the way we'll start with it is, you know, Matt's, uh, we spent some time in advance talking about this relationship between philosophy and system. Um, I think the, the appropriate place to start would be to say, you know, walk us, particularly for those who maybe didn't get a chance to have a look at the document, mm. walk us through kind of what you've laid out for us in terms of what is your defensive philosophy and how does that basically shape your defensive system and yeah. then maybe as you go through that talk about the difference between those two things yeah so i think for me like the the my philosophy has really been shaped a lot by my experience as a player um and i suppose you know i've been really lucky to have a number of really high level coaches um coach me throughout my my junior career um and I suppose being in the Breakers Academy and being a representative player and being on national teams and NBL, like you, you kind of pick up things, right? So my philosophy has been shaped by all of those experiences. Um, and I would say in particular, my, um, if John watches us back later, he won't be happy. But um, when, I, when I moved to Hibiscus Coast to play, when I moved from Harbour to Coast to play under Steve Doan, um, mm. and I would say the reason that that shaped me so much is because, you know, I was a good player. I had skill and I, you know, when you start playing basketball at four years old, hopefully by the time you get to 18, you kind of know what you're doing. Um, so I was, you know, I was, I was a good player. I was on a national team and whatnot, but I would say that I was a little bit more on the lazy side of things and I could get away with, um, being a little bit soft, being a little bit slow, being a little bit on the back foot, just because I knew what I was doing. Mm. Um, and so when I moved to coast, I moved there because I felt like I hadn't really been challenged. I felt like my coaches up until that point at Harvard, and obviously I was homeschooled, so I didn't have the, 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 the school side of things. So Harvard basketball really was my thing. Um, and so as an under 17 player, I had, I felt like I hadn't really been pushed in the way that I needed to be pushed. And when I got to coast and played for Steve, that's exactly what he did. And then some, and so I think that my experience along with probably like five or six other national team players that year and the, the rate of improvement that we made and the, and the um, change in our game, I think was so obvious that my learning from that really shaped the way that I then approached the game moving into the coaching space. So I guess if I could describe my philosophy, I am all about just work ethic. You know, I'm all about building guys that have got some toughness that won't take a step down. Um, you know, I'm all about putting the opposition under as much pressure as possible. And I'm all about having our guys on my team just work their ass off as much as possible. And I think that that stems from, like I said, my experience, but also the types of players that I see in our catchment. And I think that stems a lot from, um, you know, the areas that I see that they need improvement on. So, you know, as, as you go through the reading, you'll, you'll notice words like toughness, work rate, um, 
competitiveness, um, just kind of getting after it. Um, and then I suppose, you know, if you tie that to the system that, that I have built over time, <laughs> um, that will continue to evolve and change and, and adjust, um, you know, I think it's pretty, pretty obvious and it's pretty clear that that stem that kind of flows down to the system. So, you know, full court defense, get up and in, work your dude. I mean, Terrence Abdon is just like my favorite player ever because that's all he does. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that type of thing in the full court, working back to, um, you know, just guarding it hard and guarding it strong and have no, you know, I often say to my teams, and this, you know, it's a pretty standard saying, but it really doesn't matter if you're up 20 or down 20. You know, you got to play every position like you're building the habits that are going to help you transfer your game to the next level. Um, obviously, that's easier said than done. But, um, you know, just really about building accountability. I hate it when it, I really get pissed off when my players start making excuses or they start to make excuses. And I think that's a big part of why we don't help. Um, <laughs> really about putting philosophy right yeah. yeah putting putting the onus on them you know to take care of your own crap and then you know we'll all be fine <laughs> and obviously that's a very simplistic way of looking at things but um and it's not probably reality but um if that's the starting point then i think you know that builds something really really strong um it was funny because i remember I remember that year that I moved to coast and um, I don't know if someone asked Steve, our coach, he was kind of like, Oh, are we going to do like any like team building activities? And he just like started laughing and he was like, ha. he was like, um, you know, we're not going to have pizza. We're not going to go bowling. We're not going to go watch a movie. You keep it in front. You keep it in front. You keep it in front. That's how we're going to make culture here. You know, if you trust each other, then we've got some culture. So so you would say that, so Steve, as a coach, hmm. was someone who um, believed very much in guarding the ball, it sounds like. That was, that was like when we, because like, I think the thing that's interesting about your philosophy um, that I think is, I don't see as much in New Zealand as I do in the US, and hmm. I'd be curious to hear what Justin thinks about this as well, but like, you're really about, don't let your man get by you. And yep. we have a lot of kids who let their man get by them. <laughs> like, this is like, to me, such like, it's it's such a simple thing, but it's something mm. that we are really, really bad at yeah. in New Zealand, is sitting down and just guarding, not reaching and keeping them in front, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I think that that, you know, I think back to coming through the, the representative system and it's just taught so early about like helping, mm. you know what I mean? Like it's, it's almost like one of the first things that you learn on defense is well, when you, at least when you get into like a team environment is where your help's coming from. Mm. Um, and I get that you need a little bit of that just to allow, you know, those kids that can't keep it in front or whatnot that are a little bit maybe physically challenged or aren't developing as early, but I don't know. I just think it sends a really, I think it sends the wrong message ultimately to, to rely on that at such a young age. Um, mm. And I, to be honest, I mean, if you speak to, if you speak to national team coaches, um, you know, a huge thing that happens at world championships and Asia events is that we just can't keep it in front. Mm. You know, we just can't against better guys. Mm. Um, and so I suppose, you know, looking back at my experience, I think that was a massive thing. You know, when I was a player, um, when I'm guarding someone from, you know, counties B or whatever, like, yeah. I don't really have to work that hard because I just know where he's probably going to dribble right and I can get there. You know what I mean? So you're not challenged. So I think the role of the coach and what I take on myself is really to, if the, if the opposition isn't going to challenge my guys, then I need to. Mm. Um, and that's kind of a big part of what we do at practice. Yeah. So can you just walk us through then, you know, like, so you've obviously got this, this tough, um, you know, very kind of like engaged, on the front foot defensive philosophy that's grounded in, in not stopping the ball. Can you just walk us or in grounded in stopping the ball and not allowing dribble mm -hmm. penetration? 
um, and and not being reliant upon help, I think, which is kind of what I'm hearing. Mm. As well, like talk more about your system. Like talk more about how your what, how your system works. What are the kind of core principles of your system from full court into half court? Mm. You know, what does what does a Matt Lacy team do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think just recently, and and probably a lot of you guys would have would have been on the same page around the recent, relatively recent introduction of of jamming to to the New Zealand national style of play. Um, and so, um, you know, I won't spend too much time on that, but we certainly start with that. Um, it's something that we still don't do a 10 out of 10 job on, but it's a, it's a work in progress. But I, I suppose, you know, for us, it's, it's about guarding it the full length of the floor. So even on an inbound, you know, if we score, if it's a baseline out of bounds, we are physical and we are forcing physically our, our offensive guys towards the baseline and, and that obviously aligns to some of the trapping systems that we run too but even in a man-to-man -man, mm. we are just pushing it like crazy towards the baseline as, as much as possible and then you know I suppose it's that whole it's that whole consistent work rate thing around if we can just wear guys down you know ultimately we might not reap the reap the benefits until later in the game but mm. um it's about just applying as much pressure as possible. And I suppose if you think about that in a single position, I often talk to my guys about, you know, get in your dude. And obviously we need plugs and whatnot behind that just to, just to give some sort of safety net, but get in your dude and try and turn him as much as possible because yeah. mistakes may, are made when you have to cross it over. Mm. You know, mm. when you're going in one direction hard most guys are pretty comfortable doing that. So in the full court, it's really just about applying as much pressure as you can and making them turn it. Obviously, depending on the athletes and the guys that we have on our team. Um, and then in the half court, you know, as we get back into that, I mean, it's, it's really super simple. <laughs> like, it's not super complex. It's just get in a stance and guard it, you know, and be on the, I think, I think one thing that, you know, I really learned a lot through those last few years of rep basketball was, yes, it is about physically keeping in front, but it's also about the message that you send to an opposition team and mm. players. If mm. you're in a stance and you are hungry, mm. truly hungry and desperate to stay in front of it, all of a sudden someone might think, oh, crap, this dude's kind of got it under control and I might just shift it. Mm. You know what I mean? And if you've got five guys doing that, then they know from the outset that this, that this game isn't going to be easy, mm. right? We're going to have to work for everything. And if we can do that as a, as a group of five consistently and just be, have great energy. I talk a lot about energy and I talk a lot about the visual thing, you know, the stance and the hands and the togetherness and the communication. If we can have all those intangibles working together, it's, it's pretty, you know, um, from, from an offensive perspective, it is a little bit daunting. Um, so it, really from, from a system perspective, it is keeping in front, getting a stance, and then we build around it. So, you know, you'll see on my, on my checklist, I've kind of got no help one and two passes away. Um, that doesn't mean that my guys are out in denials and stuff like that. We might do that as a mix up, especially if we feel like we can really kind of push it a little bit further, but often we are in pack positioning. Um, and I suppose that's where, um, that's just like, like for all of us, we've all got decisions to make. And, and for the most part, where my teams are in driving lanes so that visually the guy with the ball in hand doesn't just see wide open lanes. Right. And so we are, we that's are sort of not thing than necessarily yeah. saying yeah. we're here to help you. It's more like discouraging the drive because we're in the lane, but we're right. not necessarily wa wanting to yeah. over help or play a, a kind of a pure pack line style defense and i suppose it's it's visual help right yeah, right and so you know we're talking about one way closeout so if, if penetration happens and i'm in that pat position one pass away i'm only moving towards my man yeah um so we like i said in the doc it's not like we don't have help but everybody is very aware that if you can't guard it you're not going to get on and we start all of our practice, well, not all of our practices, but certainly the season with one-on-one -on -one and everybody is watching, everybody's literally watching the one-on-one -on -one game. <laughs> like, 
like it's who can guard and if you can't guard you better go work on it because right. this is what we do right and so if we're kind of like and i think you know maybe sort of a it's funny because i think in your um in your document particularly the first part you talk about the philo part of a, of knowing a philosophy is mm -hmm. when i watch a team you know what do i want to see you yeah. know like your philosophy is evident yeah. in the first minute of watching uh, of someone watching you play mm. um, you know or first few minutes of someone watching you play and so if i'm you know obviously i've spent lots of time watching your teams play when we when, when i see a matt lacy team i see someone you know up on the ball in the full court which again i think is something that was very common in the u.s you know like particularly mm. athletic teams or inner yeah. city teams they're guarding you on 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 inbound yeah and it's not necessarily a trap it's not necessarily, but it, it's, it's, I'm guarding you on inbound and I'm making you work in the back yeah. to get the ball across half court, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then when you get into half court, I'm not stopping. I'm not mm -hmm. going to like stop hounding you, but I'm, but I don't necessarily want to get a foul. And I guess that's my question is what's the, what's the line there between aggressive and actually unnecessary contact or, yeah. you know, and particularly going for steals, because I think a lot of young kids, mm -hmm. a lot of the kids that I see, are willing to be aggressive, but it's mm. almost always for a steal mm. and not necessarily for the purpose of pressuring, if that mm. makes sense, particularly in the young age. Yeah, no, it does make sense. And I and I would answer that question to say it depends on the age group. Right. Because I, you know, when I was coaching junior prems, I well, I would say my teams fell a lot regardless. <laughs> <laughs> we uh we fell out a lot. Um and I think some teams get frustrated by that. But um if I'm coaching a junior prem team and when I was coaching that team, I really did not care if my guys fouled out. I couldn't mm -hmm. care less. I actually kind of liked it. Okay. Because ultimately I would rather five guys getting involved and getting amongst it. And if there's a 50, 50 or even like a 60, 40 in their favor and just having a crack at it, like, cool, let's do that. Mm -hmm. um, so at that age group, I almost over reward aggressiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm. because I want them to know that it's okay. I, I mean, teaching, teaching, <laughs> teaching North Shore boys to trap the basketball is a lot harder than you think. Mm. So, um, <laughs> why do you say that? Like, what do you mean by that? Because they're there for, and this is obviously an, um, an over simplistic assessment, but, um, that when you say trap it, they don't trap it the way that I want them to trap it, which is just, well, I say foul mm. or steal. You got to foul him or steal it. Mm. And a lot of the times they come up and all passive and then it's a split and then it's a kind of there's two guys there, but they're not really there. I see what you mean. Yeah. So I would rather them at least in the, in the in the first part of the season, just go after it. Um, and then obviously as you build up and for my team with the Prems, it's, it's obviously a little bit different. I expect them to be able to do that yeah. um, without fouling. Yeah. Um, I would say in terms of the going for the steal is probably a little bit more relevant at that age group where, where guys are fully aware of what they're doing and they've got a, have got a reasonable IQ by that point, um, an understanding of the game. Um, and that's kind of where, to me, it's about reshaping what they think, um, like, so, defensive successes. You know, they really want that steal to the kind of, breakaway dunk or the breakaway finish or you know they want the stat right mm. but to me as a as a group it's about building continuous pressure mm. so um you know that starts on the shot jam full court plugs right back to half court stand your man pressure that thing on ball comes hard show go at it rotate just did the crazy go mm. and so if you are in that one pass away or two passes away and the ball skips and you go for it and you miss it Mm. all of a sudden offense gets a breath right they attack we have to rotate then we're out of sorts mm. same things happen when often you know we'll because we're so small we'll end up in a mismatch with the post or we've just got a little guy fronting yep how many times i've had to just remind our guys if a lob goes mm. you either again have to steal it or foul them yeah Right. You can't miss the lob and then he gets two points. And that's obviously a, a very clear um, plus minus two points versus 
not two points. So it's kind of that thing where they've just got to understand, um, you know, the whole release of pressure idea is, is massive. Right. So I think maybe now would be a good time to maybe sort of like for me to pause kind of my questions and open it up to the group. Um, if anybody's got a question or even just a comment, you know, like maybe something that Matt said, like really resonates with you or, or a question around something, maybe just um, raise your hand um, and, and I'll call on you. Um, otherwise, I've, I've, we can kind of start moving into some real specifics. Does anybody have a, a comment or a question at this point? Okay, sounds like we're okay. I would um, just, um, there's just one thing I was thinking about before, um, before the chat um, and about my philosophy. I was thinking back to the first season that I coached for Rosemary. Um, and <laughs> I was thinking about what we were doing offensively and defensively. And, you know, I think st at the start of my, in the first few years of my coaching, I really, I, we were doing things right. Like we, it's not like we weren't just like running out there and playing. Like I did have a system, but I honestly, if you asked me why we were doing certain things, I wouldn't be able to tell you, mm. you know what I mean? Like we were just kind of playing and, and I was, I was, including things because I had some good experience as a player. I knew, I knew concepts, right? So I could teach that and I could do that. So I had a system, but I really didn't know why we were doing it. Um, I mean, I was thinking about it before. Offensively, we were running triangle with year nine and tens with 13 and 14 year old dudes. I mean, what the hell yeah, is right. that? <laughs> like, who does that? What the right. hell? Yeah. Right. Um, and that, I mean, that's a conversation for another day. Another but. conversation, because there are people who do that and have stuck yeah. for a very long time. Yeah. So, I mean, I was doing that. And again, it took it took a conversation with with Steve, actually. You know, I'd kind of catch up with him. I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing. What, you know, what is this? This dude's frustrating me or, you know, whatever it was, whatever the day was. But, um, you know, he really gave me clarity around at that age group, and I think it's I think it's quite consistent all throughout junior basketball. Is you know your job as the coach is to make players better. Your job as a coach is to develop, and your job as a coach is to prepare your players for the next level, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. And so, you know that when he questioned me on that, and he said, "Why are you doing that?" or "How is that helping him?" Right. How does that help this dude who wants to make an 18 next year? I think that really forced me to take a look at what I was doing mm -hmm. um, and made me answer some questions that I didn't have answers to before. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I really started to figure out, like, I want to create these types of players so that at the next level they can be successful. I want them to be tough and hardworking. And I want them to be able to pressure the ball. I don't want them to be lazy. I don't want them to be like me. Right. You know what I mean? I want them to be on the front foot and to learn these things early. And in order to do that, I need to pressure the ball. In order to do that, I need to get them aggressive and tracking it. And I need to, um, you know, really push the box out. And so I think as a young coach, I really found that I was doing things, but there was no purpose behind it. Maybe other than just trying to win the game, I suppose. <laughs> right, 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 right. And I think this is a really important point because, you know, a lot of, you know, particularly if you're coaching young players, I mean, everyone is young, right? In the sense that we're all coaching teenagers who are, yeah. are going to play somewhere next year with a different coach, right? Yeah. Um, more, more likely than not. And unless you're coaching, you know, uh, maybe if you're coaching a year 13 who's on a prem sort of situation or what yeah. have you. But like, generally speaking, the question really is, what defensive things, and then we've talked about this offensively as well, what are the defensive things that I that we want players to leave my team mm. having become better at that will translate to the next mm. team they play on? Mm. And I think this is really where you get into that question, and I think this is a really important question for youth basketball, is trapping, you know, and mm. the, the sort of, and we've seen this with lots of, you know, certainly at regionals, if you went to regionals, watch under 13 regionals, the teams who win are the teams who are trapping and pressing in the in the backcourt. They're not necessarily playing man pressure in the backcourt. They are trapping in the backcourt. Yeah. And trapping is a winning strategy in in very young ages, but it mm -hmm. is not a development strategy for, mm -hmm. for developing skill mm -hmm. downstream. And so I think that that's a really important question. And so like yeah. you've, 
in, in quite a bit of your stuff, you've talked about trapping. Mm -hmm. When do you trap? Yeah. When do you not trap? Yeah. You know, like what's, what's your philosophy there and, and on, on trapping? Yeah. Well, I think, I think you hit it on the head. I think to be honest with you, um, my team last year in particular, I think we relied far too much on full court trapping. Mm. And I thought that we, it was a sign that our half court defense wasn't good enough mm. because we had to revert to it too much. So I think that was ultimately a weakness of my coaching that I, that I need to address. Mm. Um, I think I view trapping as, um, and that was more on reflection, like looking back at the season. Um, but I suppose I more view trapping as there's a time and a place for it, mm -hmm. you know? And I think if, if it becomes too much of your identity as a coach and as a part of your system, mm -hmm. then like you said, it's not really um, highlighting the areas that actually players need to be good at because you're right. It is a, it is a winning formula, particularly at the younger level. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we use it <laughs> is because either we're down 20, we need to come back or we feel like an opposition guard isn't strong enough to handle our pressure mm. or we uh, just kind of, a lot of the time we'll just start with it because we just want to come out of the gate strong and set the tone early. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it's a, I think the best way to use it in junior basketball is a tool to ignite some intensity as a tool to get your guys going. But I think when you, and maybe a tool to get out of trouble, mm. but I think when you use it as a core part of your identity, mm. um, that's probably where you get a little bit stuck. And I would say that's where we got a little bit stuck is if ultimately you have to trap, that means that they're scoring when you're not trapping. So, yeah. Yeah. I think um, it might be cool to kind of dive into some situation specific stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think this group is probably, we can probably talk about a couple of things. Um, one being, um, maybe we'll start with the post because I think that, mm -hmm. that the post and interior defense, we've talked a lot about, yep. you know, perimeter defense and playing in the full court. Yep. You know, we have a lot of, as you know, your teams historically are not large. You have, you, you, yeah. you know, you, you rarely have a genuinely elite size. Um, you have good length on the perimeter, on the wing, but, but mm. really not, great bigs and against you know Levix and so forth and and when Sam was at Westlake and mm. can you just talk about coaching a small team mm. to defend inside yeah you know, both in terms of defending the paint um defending um a, a, a catch in the paint or a touch in the paint it could be even off an offensive rebound mm. what generally is your philosophy um on interior defense um when you have a small team yeah and I think that you know, just for clarification, I think the last response around not letting it become too much of a part of your identity, I more mean like full court trapping. Right. Um, so I the post is a smart yeah. strategy. <laughs> yeah, like I wouldn't say yeah. don't trap the post because otherwise you're kind of relying on it. Well, yeah. when you got no one over 6'5", you kind of need to rely on it. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, it's hard to give a hard and fast rule because really a lot of what we do in the post is, is matchup dependent. You know, when we're playing someone like Nate Wilson, who is six, six, seven from Mags, and he's a really talented player and causes a bunch of headaches, we don't necessarily need to trap him because he's not a back to basket banger, right? Um, what we do need to be ultra aware of is as soon as a shot goes up, you better not look at the ball, you better look at him and you better take him out because otherwise he's going to score 20 on us just through offensive rebounding, mm. as opposed to same team, Josh Ledger um, from Mags or um, I want to use Sam, but that's probably a little bit of a different matchup, but someone that's just, you know, physical mm. and strong. Yeah. Go at him. Because if we leave that one-on-one, -on -one, even with Ray Hunter or Bouch, then we're going to get found out. Mm. Um, and so we, you know, we use a variety of traps and we often at the prem level will mix up um, the way we trap because you know three four five six times down the floor you can start to pick up on that and coach calls timeout defensive adjustment and then sometimes it's nice just to flip it on them just to really screw with them right to go to 
instead of trapping from the middle, we trap from the baseline, or instead of trapping from the baseline, we trap big to big. Yep. Um, so we definitely drill that hard because it's a big part of what we do and we have to be good at it. Mm. Um, I put, you know, someone like Levick into that category as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and then I suppose, you know, playing someone like Sam, mm. who's just a very, very skilled player, um, you have to. <laughs> you know what's interesting yeah. about that, though, Matt? I mean, like, there are teams, I think, I, I just think one of the beautiful things about American college basketball is the variety of defensive schemes that are out there. But yeah. Ben Howland coached the UCLA teams in, in 2000, sort of six, seven, and eight to the, oh. final, to the final game, right? Yeah. Like three years in a row or three straight final fours. And their, their base, the staple of their defensive philosophy was double the post. Mm. Like that was their core philosophy. And there are coaches who still do that now. I think Kelvin yeah. Sampson at Houston is the one who does that. He's a, he's a double the post guy. That's what yeah. they do. They, yeah. and, and it's because they, for them, it's not even about size. They all have size. They don't, yeah. and in fact, they actually think doubling with size mm. is a really, really smart idea because it's yeah. hard to pass over and yeah. that creates lob skip passes, which are easy to recover to. Yeah. So doubling is not just a, here's what I do when I'm small. It can be a, yeah. a, a way of manipulating the offense to yeah. actually have to play your game as opposed yeah. to, you know, you just, sure. And I think, I think, yeah, what you said is absolutely right. It's, it's ultra disruptive, right? Yeah, yeah. And so a big part of what we try to do is, is like you just said, we try and play on our terms, right? You know, we want, we want to win the game or we ultimately want to lose the game, but we don't want to give the opposition an opportunity to take it from us. Mm. And so, you know, when we, I think that's a big part of why we trap. Mm. Um, I think it's, I think it's probably also circumstantial in the, in the sense that we're able to do that in New Zealand because we haven't been found out yet. <laughs> um, and maybe, just maybe the skill level you know, and, the, and maybe the age group that we're coaching at is, has allowed for us to continue to do that. Right. Um, and so we use it to our advantage. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, where there's so many variations, I mean, outside of that, that we could get into. But that's, yeah. that's why we do it. Can you talk a little bit about um, the two? There's two things I was interested in knowing, and I'm really interested, I think, are really valuable for coaches. One. Mm. And, and it, it really, well, I guess the big thing is, is language and cues. We've, we've, I've had a couple of conversations. I remember having had a chat with, I've had a chat like with Nick and with Andrew and a couple others about like, like the language that you use when talking about defense. Mm. Um, and so that's really a lot of time is the cues, you know, like in your uh, system document, you write, you know, on guarding the ball, three keys, stance, hands, angle, you know, like, mm. So I guess what I'm interested in is what are some of the cues that you literally tell your players that um, help them, that are sort of the guiding, the guiding words? What are the sort of the guiding words that you use to help players cue into the right kind of position, right? And so mm -hmm. that could be like how to, how to close out. That could be box outs. Mm -hmm. That could be definitely mm -hmm. on the ball. Like, um, does that make sense? Kind of yeah. what, I, what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, that's, <laughs> I mean, some of the i just think about what i say all the time it's probably if you ask my players i'd probably have a bunch of them that i just hound them with but um i say get in him a lot like get in him mm. really close space and mm. and make him uncomfortable i say get in him a lot um you know things like square playing it square i would say a big one is shot goes up we we say hit mm. hit mm. yeah um you know, which obviously is and hit with hit with forearm, hit with right. shoulder. Yeah. Forearm. Hit hit first, meet your contact, eyes on your guy first, and then you can turn and look. But I don't you know I'm sure you guys are all the same. The number of times shot goes up and we all just look. Right. Yeah. I'm just like, yo, hit him. Yeah. That's you know, that's that's a big one. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean I'm trying to think that's I try and I suppose I tr I'm, I'm a big and this is maybe a little bit more into teaching but I'm big on threes 
Mm. So when I when I teach arm ball coverages, I'm big on giving three cues. Mm. Um, and obviously, with you know teaching just kind of guarding it, there's three cues there that I that I went yeah. through. But um, you know, I often talk to my guys about, and we actually just had a conversation the other day. I feel like within our system, Sunny and I are always so confident with it because it just feels like any player on our team, whether you're the first or the 12th man, everyone can be successful. Mm. And I feel like everyone can be successful because we have a very layered approach. Mm. You know what I mean? Like we try to answer every question and that's, I suppose the beauty of laying out your system in a format, like, like we've kind of spoken about and with that document is because no matter what the, you know, obviously there's going to be some, some crazy times on the floor, things that you can't prepare for. But for the most part, you know, I think that if, if firstly, if you don't know what's happening or if you haven't taught something, then how do you expect your players to be able to execute that on the floor? Yeah, right. But I, I, I would like to think that our, that, our, um, that our system is wholesome enough for any player that we have on our team to step out and really know and be confident and their ability to execute mm. our system. And mm. I think that comes down to the teaching of it. Mm. You know? So when you're, when you're guarding the ball, you know that you should be in a stance, right? You know that you should have active hands and being disruptive with one hand in and one hand disrupting a passing lane. And you know you better be square, mm. right? And then every time you're on the ball, that's where you should be. Mm. Um, and that is often, in all of our situations, we kind of have... Um, I would, I would hope <laughs> our players would have a clear understanding of, of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really, really good. Um, I'm really curious kind of what you guys are all thinking as we've been talking and, and maybe this is just a chance for me to ask some of you to just share some of your own reflections. Like, you know, Gareth, I'm really interested kind of like what, you know, this makes you think about, you know, cause you're coaching obviously a different demographic. You're, 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 you know, in terms of coaching girls, do you feel that, you know, as you're hearing Matt's t Matt talk, do you feel like what Matt's saying resonates with some of the things that you, you know, want to see from your girls? Or do you feel like it's, like, what, 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 are you, what are you thinking about as Matt's talking? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of what um, we've been trying to do is based on what Rosemary has been doing. Um, <laughs> I just feel like we're sort of five to 10 years behind where they're at and, and sure. that's where we want to get to. But it's, it's a lot harder to build that um, aggressive nature into into females, and mm -hmm. and and the big part of what we do that's different is how do, how do you do it when um, you're probably at least half your team have no interest in going to the next level, right? You know, they're just loving the moment, not mm -hmm. looking at building and going to college or anything like that. Whereas mm -hmm. I feel with boys, every single one of them wants to go play college basketball and then the NBA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. I think that's a really important point because I guess there's a there's can be a disconnect and you kind of wrote about it in your piece Matt like there can be a disconnect between the way I want to play and we and, and many of us want to play and the players that we have mm. and and I think that sort of like how do you find that harmony between a style that sort of you know certainly fits you as a coach like this is the way I like my teams to play you know mm. we, we play aggressive and then A, either having players who just don't want to play that way or B, who don't have the physiology to necessarily yeah. play the sort of up that yeah. you want. I'm thinking about even Roger's team, you know, like your team this year, Roger, like had a couple guys who just, you know, like they clearly like basketball. They clearly enjoy training, um, but getting them to be aggressive defensively was, was a challenge, was really a challenge, right? Um, any comments there, Roger? We'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, um, but I, I just think it goes back to a little bit of the North Shore thing, eh? and, and definitely that help defense that they're taught to is really young, so, that, so they really don't want to play that tough, mm. and they know that someone's going to cover them. So, you know, that starts way back at the beginning. Mm. 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 Yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts? Anybody else got a thought? Kane, what do you think? What's your thought about all this? Um. Uh, go back to what, and I'll reflect back on to my teaching as well, that mostly through the, through the season of Wolf Harbour, I've mainly focused on offense and being reliant on, yeah, we're, it's a North Shore thing. We've all been taught outside defense, so I haven't really got into them about that because my team, our 17B team is really structured on playing quick and 
being really aggressive and sometimes we were too over aggressive and we foul way too much. Mm. And Nick will notice too is that we're averaging about 16 to 20 fouls per game. Mm. So it's kind of making sure to keep them accountable to how physical do we want to be. And sometimes, yes, what Matt touched on before, yeah, it can be great. But in terms of teams that are going to execute free throws, like against Auckland and Wabi, counties that executed their free throws and that killed us. Mm. That's for me to adjust on how physical do we want to play, how smart do we want to be with it, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I I think, you know, like, if I could just throw one thought in there, I do hear the kind of teaching half court um, help defense too much. I think if I could play the devil's advocate a little bit, the, mm -hmm. the devil's advocate would say that we also have a problem of standing and watching off the ball. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a problem of kids who really are not engaged off the ball. Mm -hmm. It's different from sort of like over helping mm -hmm. versus playing passively off the ball. Mm -hmm. And I think that like we still have a huge issue, particularly in the junior grades of kids who basically hug their man off the ball. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're just not paying attention to what's happening on, you know, they're on the weak side, they're hugging their man and they're not active ready to step over and help and i see that being also a problem um mm. in in terms of of that and i almost feel like you know do we have to pick one or the other like because i don't want us to get necessarily into a position where we're saying i'm not going to teach help defense at all mm. and whereas i think you can still teach help defense while also teaching guard the ball and don't let don't let the man go by you you know because I, I feel like they they that's what good defenses do right mm -hmm. like you don't have to help if your man hasn't been beaten but if he is then I step over and help I feel like that's like yeah. a pretty that's kind of a concept that players can learn yeah no for sure and I think you know like I mean I'll just reflect on how how we go about it is I think it is really difficult when this is where I think priorities are so important. Yeah. Because I think when you look at things, I mean, I could pick 20 things I want to work on, you yeah. know what I mean? And 20 things that are important to me. Yeah. But I think this is where um, it's all about how you layer. Yeah. It's about how you teach it, how you build it. And so for us, you know, for the first month or two, we are all about just on the ball and one pass away. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's not to say that we might, if there's someone that's terrible off the ball, we might, you know, just have a word to them and say, yo, like this needs to be, you know, you need to pick this up or whatever it is. But, um, oh, for sure. For, I I 100% agree with you. Um, I think that once you get, once you tick off that first priority or the second or the third, that's when you start to layer in the more, yeah. more teaching. And, you know, our expectation is get in a stance off the ball, because again, not only do you need to be ready to move and to help and to, you know, if you need to help or step up or rotate to your man or whatever, but again, we are massive on what that visual looks like and what message does that send to the opposition? Yeah. Right. And so, if you're up in a stance and you know no activity with the hands or you know no intensity or no communication and that's why you know i think our team is not super effective in communication but i would like to think when we get going we're pretty loud mm -hmm. and that's again kind of a priority thing is like firstly i just want you to say something and then we can talk about what you actually say right. so um if you're in a stance and engaged and communicating then all of a sudden that's a very different feel on the weak side and you can live with that. Mm. And then it's about, okay, now it's about decision making in terms of when yeah. you step up and when you don't. And now it's about what are you actually saying versus just low, 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 right? But I think, again, you can't expect everything to happen at once. And you probably can't even expect them to be great at it by the end of the season if you're coaching under 15s or under 17s. You know, it's, it's really about good. building yeah. it. I think it's a really good point, kind of like, and I think one of the key takeaways I would sort of really encourage from this conversation is just sort of like knowing, knowing your team, knowing your players, um, 
you know, like really setting those clear priorities, particularly at the beginning of the season that are like the hallmarks of your defensive philosophy and your defensive system mm. that are, that are quite simple, um, but, but effective. Um, and, you know, so for example, you know, that concept of like keeping, just keep the ball in front, our number one, mm. you know, we want to keep the ball in front. We don't want to have to help. Um, and maybe like building on that, could you talk about like how you approach the challenge of like, okay, that's our philosophy. That's our, that's what we're going to try to do. Mm -hmm. What if I have some slow players on my team? <laughs> what if I've got, you know, I've got a Will Heather who's not mm -hmm. clearly the mobile guy mm -hmm. that, you know, cruises, mm -hmm. um, you know, that other guys are going to be, yeah. how am I coaching a slower player um, to play my aggressive yeah. keep the ball in front philosophy? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that that's where like, that's kind of where I had my learning, you know, I kind of mentioned some learning in there and that document is around like, I wanted everyone to just go, you know, yeah. I just wanted everyone to be like a phenomenal defender, right? And I think that that's obviously unrealistic. Yeah. Um, and that just came with experience and, experience and realizing that not everyone is going to be exactly what you want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that they can't do it. Right. Um, it will just look different. And so, you know, when you're dealing with slower guys, and I'm even thinking, Kane, from your Melbourne team, you know, there were definitely some dudes in that team that were slower. Yeah. Um, take a step off. You know, if we're, if we're teaching, you know, hand distance, go hand and a half distance. Sorry, arm distance, you know, go arm and a half length. Um, and then the second thing, you know, obviously that's quite simple. Um, but I would, like, there's a, there's a difference between giving them an adjustment and letting them off the hook. Right. And mm -hmm. so you can take a step and a half back, but you better get in the bloody stance and keep it in front. So I'm talking to Will about get out of Hawks Bay mode, get out of just rolling up to practice and thinking you got it covered with your hook shot and show me something, right? Get in the stance mm -hmm. and, and send that message, you know, because otherwise, I mean, it would look like he was asleep half the time right um and then secondary to that you know i'm talking to guys like crews that are around him that are ultra capable and i'm saying you know what when will is guarding that guy you need to take another step in and you just need to be there for him and you need to add a little bit of chatter and just disrupt that guy's thinking you know well i got your left here got you got you you got it you got it you know just to kind of disrupt the thinking and and giving him more confidence sure. Um, so, so leaning on your more capable guys yeah. and that's where you have a quiet word. It's not a, yo, everybody will is slower. It's about <laughs> truth. <Yeah. laughs> Let's yeah. take you to the side and have this little chat. Yeah. Right. That's good. That's really, really good. That's really, really good. Um, cool. I think that's really, really good. I think maybe with kind of, kind of, as we move towards the end, I think there's a couple of things that I think would be really interesting for the group. Um, Maybe we could talk about ball screen coverage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have a couple kind of things that are really staples. You know, you, mm -hmm. you really like to hard show on a ball screen, but mm -hmm. you like to switch in the middle of the court. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about why you like hard show? Like, why mm -hmm. is that your kind of goal coverage? Mm -hmm. uh, and then why don't you do it in the middle of the court? Mm. Um, so... For us, hard show is aligned to our philosophy. Yeah. It makes guys get out. It makes guys move. It makes them think. Um, it puts the offense under pressure. Um, and it's really, again, it's playing on our terms. You know, we don't want to allow offensive guards to get inside the three and start to, you know, kind of feeling it out on a mush or you know, starting to like draw help and, and find guys. So we would rather send them to halfway yeah. and utilize rotations on the backside to, to kind of hold, hold the fort for a second and then build out from that. So it certainly aligns to what we do yeah. and how we want to play. Um, I think just, just one thing, and this is more of a side note, going back to kind of like preparing our guys for the next level mm. Um, we, we often try and teach a lot of the coverages mm. and that's not necessarily to use them, but more for them to know right. so that when they show up to a New Zealand 
camp and all of a sudden the national team coach wants to ice or they want to mush or, um, you know, they want to play drops, you know, our guys know what that is and how to, how to, how to execute it. Mm. So obviously there's a part of it where we need to do certain things in order for us to be successful, but then it's about how can we allow them to be successful mm. at, on an individual level? Mm. Um, so hard trying certainly a staple of what we do. And I kind of explained in the, um, in the document a little bit about why we shifted to that exclusively mm. or more exclusively. And, um, we were just getting torched <laughs> by Rangi and it was frustrating me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I wanted to kill them. But, um, but that was really a, on the basis that I thought our, our bigger guys couldn't do it. But I think, um, you know, learning throughout that season is when you push and you challenge mm -hmm. and you do it within reason um, and you do it with an, with the intention to make them better. Right. And you communicate that to them. Mm. They're all in. So like, would you say that to the team in the sense of like, um, particularly sh teaching them multiple coverage and saying, Hey guys, you need to know this. You're going to mm -hmm. need to know this for where you want to go kind of after that. Mm -hmm. um, or conversely, if that's not the motivation, it can also be, Hey, we need to know multiple coverages because we know, we never know when we might need for to sure. do something different. And, you know, I think that if I can use that team for an example, you know, we had Will Heather and Peter Jenkins showed anyway, but um, two very different in terms of getting back to your guys point around, you know, you've got guys that just want to go to different levels, you know, to Will, I'm saying, if you want a scholarship, you better get out there and do this. Right. And then for Peter, it's like, if you want to help us win, you need to get out there and do this. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, just kind of playing to their motivations for yeah. sure. Um, and then in terms of the second question around why not show in the middle, I mean, I suppose the, a huge part of the, the hard show concept is who is the catch guy and understanding um, rotations on the backside in order to, to take rollers and to, to step up and hit or, mm. or to hold, hold the fire for a second while we rotate out. Um, and when you're in the middle of the floor, obviously it's a lot harder to know which, which two of the corner guys defensively is taking the roller. Right. Um, you know, there's obviously triple switch scenarios and some other things that you can kind of build on to, to, um, to try and get around that. Um, or just some rules, of course, but we, I mean, in terms of the makeup of our team, it's pretty comfortable. We're pretty comfortable switching. So that's what we do in the middle. Yeah, and switching can be a more reliable philosophy if you have the same size as players. You mm -hmm. know, like it's, it's like, you know, there's less, there's less, there's fewer things happening, so there's less mm -hmm. opportunity for error. For sure. Right. But on the side, on the if you're on one half of the court, if you're on the wing, the hedge allows you to dictate where the ball's going, which mm -hmm. is part of your philosophy. So you can't dictate the ball. Yep. the same way in the middle of the court that you can when you're on the side of the court you can push down into the corners um which is kind of you got, you got sidelines to work with i mean you're really boxing guys in right. um in that area of the floor and obviously in the middle there's there's a whole lot more room to move which right which when you've got two guys on the ball at one time ability to pick apart you know they've got they've got two, three, four passing options out of the hard show on a wing there's there's less angles to to work with so sure. um, yeah yeah that's kind of where we're at. Cool. Cool. Um, that's really, really good. Um, what is mush and shirt tail? Just for the, just for reference, just for the guys who maybe don't know that terminology. Um, Cause you've used that. Um, mm. You've used the reference for your off ball for, for defending throw and goes and for de defending yeah. um, off ball screens. What is mush and shirt tail? So shirt tail is, if you just think about a simple down screen, um, Shirt tail is the defender who is guarding often the guard who is receiving the screen, who's coming off the screen. Mm -hmm. Their job is to almost like latch onto the offensive shirt mm -hmm. <laughs> and trail over the top of the screen. So it's really, it's really just not going under. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that I added a little kind of, I think I did some brackets like don't get hit is because shirt, oh, shirt tail, I think I did. Oh, I meant to say shirt trail. Um, well, maybe, I don't know. Oh, it's, the same thing. it's the same thing. That's um, a trail. It's a trail, right? Like yeah. you're, you're <laughs> but, but the point is, is that you really don't want to trail 
mm. you want to get through and you want to get through physically so that you don't get hit. Yeah. Um, obviously, the best defenders are the ones that don't get hit on screen. So it's, it's going over the top, mm. but almost trying to really bust through the screen so that you are um, in line with the guard or at least knocking him off his, off his line to get through that screen. Um, do you then, want your players to actually make, like you don't want them to get screened, but do you want them to make contact with the screener? Because sometimes like, I, I'm, I just remember being like a very tiny guy and yeah. being, trying to screen players and like much bigger players would be like, uh, I'm gonna just like take my shoulder into your yeah. <laughs> tiny ass chest and you know, basically try to take you out. Some, some teams will coach defenders to be aggressive with screeners even and and yeah. you know really like hit that shoulder or hit that mm. side um mm. so that they feel that contact do you do anything like that i'm a little bit more of um you know hitting hitting the guy that you're guarding mm. I, I want you to get into his hip because mm. ultimately you know the way i see it is is the pin down guy is often the screener is often bigger and stronger mm. Mm. and being stationary he's a lot more mm he's a lot more rigid, right? Whereas if you're getting into the hip of a guy that's moving mm. um, and a guy of a similar size to you, you probably have a little bit more right. uh, room to make physical contact and to make effective contact. Okay. Um, so we're more about pushing the, pushing the guard off the line. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you, if you have a little gap to get through and you might need to take some of the, the, the screener out, then I'm all for that too. Yeah. Um, in terms of the mush, I mean, uh, I think sometimes I need to brush up on my terminology. It might not be accurate, but it, it's more its more um, kind of one of those things out of the ball screen coverage and mush is more of like, it's not a flat show. It's because you're not necessarily showing, but your, your chest, if it's say like a wing arm ball or a middle arm ball, your chest is more to halfway yeah. and you're sinking um, to kind of contain the ball while the guard gets over the top. And once he's back in front, then you're releasing to your man. And then out of pin downs, I see I use, I, I use mush, mush again in terms of throwing, going off ball screens. Again, it's kind of just yeah. taking away the curl on off ball screens, yeah. being in a stance to see the ball in your man, and then taking away the curl once the guard's back in front. Same thing with the throw over too, right? Like yeah. you kind of yeah. have, you have a buffer. If, if they get downhill, you're, you're there in the, in, in the mm -hmm. driving lane. On, on yeah. The cap. Yeah. yeah. What about, um, so we've got a little bit, you know, maybe about 10 or 15 minutes kind of before I want to start wrapping up. Um, kind of a couple other maybe just interesting questions and, and mm. other people have things that we haven't talked about, you know, throw them in there, but I think maybe it would be interesting. Um, how do you approach trials? So like mm. thinking defensively about selecting players, mm. how do you like in, you know, knowing what we know now kind of about your mm. um, defensive philosophy and the kind of systems that you run how do you think about player selection during trials um i think two things come to mind firstly one-on-one -on -one. Mm. um just who can guard yep. um and then secondly i i probably don't necessarily particularly at rosmany mm. A little bit different at Harbour because you're dealing with like a slightly older age group and a slightly higher um, cons like consistency of level in terms of guys. Um, but I more look at how they go about this stuff mm. and how they play as opposed to what they do or don't do because i've i mean i've picked some guys this year in my rosemary team that if you look at them you're like holy crap they are raw <laughs> and they don't know what they're doing okay but um i picked a dude that just screamed screamed up, like ball screen coverages mm -hmm. i mean he couldn't execute it but mm -hmm. um it's that kind of intensity and that kind of just communication mm -hmm. that I can teach you how to hard show and I can teach you what angle you need to be at and the timing of it, but it's a lot harder. I mean, to, I, I think that was, it was Roger or Gareth that said just that North shore mentality by that age, it's just hard to yeah. get them moving. And that's why I think it's so important to instill that at a, at a young age. But, um, you know, if you, if there's some traits there and if there's some intensity there that you can then channel, 
in the areas that you want to utilize it at, then I think that that's really um, important. Um, you know, I'm just trying to, I think at the, when you're dealing with some more um, evenly talented players or, you know, more in like a rep space where you've got a bunch of guys that are like almost skill wise or, you know, it's, it's a little bit more even. Mm. Um, yeah, I just got to say, like, if it comes down to it, I'm just taking the dude that's more competitive. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just taking the dude. And that's, again, simplistic because you've got to take into account long-term development and and some different size and athleticism of factors and who might be a long-term project and whatnot. But I suppose the, to put it simply and not to get too deep on it, but... Um, I'm just a big fan of competitiveness and guys that just want to get after it. Like you should compete and you trust your, your, the simplicity of your system and your coaching ability to take kind of that to the next place. But, and you know that it'll take some time. And Yeah. And I would say, you know, there's, there's been some times where that's, that's where I do take a dude that hasn't got maybe the skill set, but I would, I mean, there's, um, Kane, he might be on your team, actually. You know, there's some guys that I would take just because of the way in which they play physically and competitively yep. um, that I would take over someone that is skilled because I think time and time again, it's proven that skill, you know, will help. But when push comes to shove and we need we need a position or we need a bucket, then the dude that's got a little bit more fire and is going to come up trumps for you. Um, that's really, really good. Um, I think this would be an interesting question for the group. Um, and again, guys, if you have a question, you know, throw something out there or a comment, um, just raise your hand, um, or even just throw it in the group chat. Um, you, so we went to the U S last year hmm. and really curious your perception of defense kind of coming out of that, like both in the sense of what we needed to do to be effective defensively against American players. Mm. And again, in an AAU type setting where mm. teams are not running um, particularly um, organized offense, there was maybe one or two teams that we ran that really did, you mm. know, ran, ran an organized offense. Um, but, you know, in terms of us defending them, but then also how they defend us. Mm. Um, what, what's, what was kind of your reflection coming out of there about, you know, about defense and, and the U.S. style. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that from, you know, their defense, and I, I think it's it's a little bit more reflective of the AAU system than, than American players as a whole. Yeah. But it's it's individual, and it's there's not a whole lot of team concepts. It's, it's, um, it's one-on-one, which kind of... <laughs> makes it sound like it's my system but not quite um so <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's relying on athleticism and it's relying on physicality mm. um and to be honest it's no one really wants to play it they just want to kind of get some buckets so that you know the coaches take a look at them but um yeah probably not a huge amount of learning from the sense of their defense although i would say um I thought our guys handled the pressure relatively well overall. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, there's certainly, um, as a country, we need to be better at handling pressure. And I think that, um, you know, probably more my experience with the national team playing Australia and yeah. play, playing against a team that has athleticism, but also has, has some core concepts around how they pressure the basketball yeah. and how they use each other to pressure the basketball. Yeah, sure. I think that's proof that we need to do a better job um, of developing guards that are used to playing with pressure, mm -hmm. but then also instilling press breaks and instilling, giving them tools and enable to enable them to handle that pressure, I think is important mm -hmm. um, because you can't expect guys that haven't had the experience ever to chuck them in the fire and think that they're going to deal with it on their own. So um, yeah. some, some good learnings there. Um, I think from our perspective, you know, probably to be honest with you a little bit more, um, and this is where I would probably adjust my system quite a bit, um, is if I'm taking a team that's going over to play some athletes, right, and to play some, 
players that are physically superior than my team, mm -hmm. then I have to adjust my thinking. Mm -hmm. and I can't overpressure the ball. I can't get too hung up on expectations about one-on-one -on -one containment because at the end of the day, they're the better athletes. Mm. Um, so that's where I think our defensive philosophy shifted a little bit more to um, traditional pack and traditional, um, you know, um, packing it in. I wouldn't say help because I still don't think in a pack defense, the goal isn't to help. Um, it's it's about working together to to clog lanes and to yeah, and yeah. to shift the ball through the perimeter. Um, so. Yeah. I suppose my takeaway is the importance of teaching really solid foundational um, defense that really um, really doesn't allow dribble penetration mm. um, because I suppose that there's a lot of quick guards. There's a lot of quick guards um, and not so many great shooters. I thought that was um, interesting. What was interesting there? Kane, we'll come to you in a sec. Um, so I, I thought what was interesting about the U.S., and I agree with you, was – a in an in an AAU environment again, um, but spread you out completely. Right. And you know there was one team in particular. The only game we lost really was the team who basically found one guy who they wanted to guard the ball and spread everybody else out and let that player on offense go one on one for an entire mm. session. <laughs> there was no shot clock, so he he just sit there and kind of take his time and. And, we, and not only was it a situation where you, they put you on an island, they also were um, – we got a, quite a few uh, fouling jump shots, so three mm -hmm. fouling three-point shooters. So, you know, that kind of – a lot of that game of being able to kind of dance with the ball, end yeah. up in a situation where they kind of step back for a shot and head fake you yeah. and get you up in the air and then get you to the free throw line. And we don't see that a ton here. No, I know. I think maybe over the next few years, as players get more into, um, and I know a lot of work is happening there, kind of in that individual one-on-one -on -one skill development. I know guys like Zach and Justin and so forth are putting a lot of time in developing, helping players develop their skill game. Yeah. Um, but like, you really needed to guard. You you really really needed to guard the ball. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. you really really needed to. Um, and. I think that that was something that you had to be able to guard the full, guard the ball and contest without fouling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I suppose I suppose the system is similar in the sense that you have, like you said, you have to be able to guard the ball, but it's not so much about like I would take a step back in terms of like the pressure. We yeah. don't need to over pressure the ball. Yeah, we right. more need to pack it in, contest shots, rebound, and go. Right. Um, so just a, a, probably a half step back in terms of that. Yeah. Uh, Kane, Kane, you had a question. Um. Matt, did your kind of team have to change to the refing over in America? Just out of curiosity to the refs over here versus the refs over in America. Because I know that when I was over in Australia with Harbour, first 16 boys, I think against Melbourne Tigers, and Vince, you can add on to this as well, is that our team kind of were being physical, but they were, they were getting a lot of fouls. And then after that first game against Melbourne Tigers, we had to quickly adjust. Mm. On, on the fly in that tournament setting and learn how to actually play to their style of mm. rhythm? Yeah. Um, in terms of America, I would say it's probably less of adjustments in terms of what our guys do poorly. It's more of an adjustment to the rules themselves. Um, so, you know, the five second rule in terms of being guarded and the, and the half court rule and the shot clock, those are all the big adjustments that I would say from an American perspective, although we were still picked up on some, some footwork issues. Mm -hmm. um, but that isn't American specific. I think that's just New Zealanders have poor footwork. <laughs> um, and I think that Australia is a great, it's so great that it's so close to home because they referee it much closer to the FIBA style of, of or FIBA standard of refereeing. Mm -hmm. Gareth, I'm not sure if you, um, would agree disagree um i'm certainly no referee expert but um yeah i think that playing in australia um is fantastic because we are so we're so bad at just playing with hands here defensively um yeah. and that you know and kind of circling back to me being okay with fouls i'm okay with aggressive fouls i'm not okay with poor defensive fouls in terms of using hands yeah um 
you know, kind of, um, you know, just stupid fouls. Um, but yeah, no, I would say is my answer, it's more rules in America. Yeah. Cool. I also think we also probably started to learn, I think we actually really started, and maybe Terrence was probably the best one of really appreciating verticality. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that as a, one of the defensive <laughs> people. yeah, no, it was ironic. The smallest player on the team, right? Five, nine. But I think Terrence really, really, one of the things we did do was we did quite a bit of video, um, in between the two tournaments. Yeah. Um, and we really kind of locked in on individual defense, um, and help defense and some of the errors we were making and the, in, the individual defensive errors were mostly around reaching, mm -hmm. um, getting called for, for blocking fouls. Um, trying to slide, making contact, and officials calling it. So they really didn't allow for as much physical contact, I think, on the dribbler as we maybe would have liked. And then defensively in help situations, I think we really kind of figured out how to help when we acknowledge that that if I jump and I go straight up and I land, mm. they can come into me as long as – but if I'm not coming into them, um, if I'm really maintaining my space – Mm. Um, and going straight up and down, I can take that contact. And that worked a few times very, very, very well. I think players mm. really started to embrace that. So that, that was something yeah. that I thought was a really good learning for the players coming out of that. Yeah. But I wish we did more here. Oh my gosh, I wish players did verticality more here. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Maybe not now. Um, I think I had um, one more question. Um, so I guess thinking about, um, maybe this last question is like a simple question. Like when do you zone? <laughs> if ever you haven't talked about zone at all. Um, mm. you don't seem to be a fan of zone. Um, but you have, you do use it occasionally. Like mm. when do you zone? Um, I'm not a fan of it because I don't think it really helps our players get better. Um, <laughs> we do it sometimes to win <laughs> uh, because, I mean, the reason I think the, one of the big reasons that we won our first championship with Rosman is because Rangi wasn't great against his own and we zoned the whole second half of the final, <laughs> which, yeah, I don't know. How much did you play that year? Thing. There's a difference between like in a final, you know, but like, is it your yeah. core defense, I guess? No, definitely not. I mean, we, I mean, I think we probably played more of it in the final than we had the whole tournament. Um, so, yeah, definitely don't use it. But I think, you know, this is probably more something I think about in terms of being effective on the international stage. I think it's another way to be disruptive. Mm. And I think that no New Zealand team, um, or, you know, there's very few New Zealand teams that have the talent to, to hang with international teams. So I think when you're putting together a system, disruption has to be at the, at the center point of that. Right. Um, and so I think if you can chuck in some zone looks um, every now and then out of certain scores or out of certain situations or, you know, even zones to man's mid position and just get the offensive teams just guessing in terms of, um, what are they running and that's a different look and just keep them on their toes and that's where I think variety comes into it I think that's where it's at its most effective mm. um, just personally um, but no we don't use it a whole lot but we will use it as a mix-up yeah it's interesting because um, when we were in um, we were at Dandenong in Melbourne mm. the Knox development officer made a comment to me that um, so basically he's been trying to shift the philosophy of the club and um, that, that shift has been um, he wants them to be primarily a man-to-man -man defensive team. Like, okay, cool. That makes sense. Yeah. And he made an, he's, he threw out an interesting a statistic, which is his guide for the, for the coaches, which was, you know, I've told them that 70% of the time they need to be a man-to-man -man team, but 30% mm. of the time I will allow them to do something else. Mm. And I would say that if there's any one thing that I think is the hallmark of an Australian team defensively, it's their willingness to mix up their defenses. Mm -hmm. and, and I've recently started to think about this a whole lot more mm. um, for us um, in terms of our willingness 
to mix up defenses mm. as a change of pace mm. while not necessarily selling out our man defense, which I yeah. think is central to player development yeah. um, and, and really should be our core philosophy. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Does that, does that sound, what do you think about that? That whole Yeah, for of- sure. I think, I think that's, um, that whole idea I think is, is valid. I mean, I think about Rob Beveridge um, who is coaching will be maybe coaching Southland. And I, I mean, that's, that's at the core of what he does. And he's had success with that at every level. I mean, yeah. he won an under 19 world championship with that type of defensive philosophy. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think that's when, again, you're utilizing mix ups to your advantage, but it's not, and I suppose it is part of your identity, but it's not at the expense of player development and, and man to man defense. And I think that's where, um, I think that's where you can really add particularly in tournament play Mm. um, some tough things to come up with, with short turnarounds and throwing things at opposition teams that they're not used to or comfortable with. And I think particularly um, about when you have a team that doesn't, that on paper doesn't have, um, doesn't stack up that well. I think that's where you can utilize that, most effectively. And I think that's where you can give your team a whole lot of confidence um, and their ability to do something different and surprise an opposition team. Yeah, cool. Cool. Well, look, we've got, you know, maybe just five minutes left. Um, We'd love to hear any kind of comments, um, any reactions, um, you know, particularly if we haven't heard from you yet, Um, certainly under no obligation to, but anybody want to share a comment or, um, or a thought? Nick, you look very um, okay. Andrew, yep, go ahead. Horks. I bet your thoughts in conversations we've had about Steve Dolan building eighty percent of your coaching philosophy. Yeah. That other twenty percent, are you actively searching out things that? You're like, I want to do this. And so you're seeking out coaches that run that philosophy. Is it organic or how do you go about finding that other 20%? Good question. Um, I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a bit of organic and I think it's a bit of seeking out um, some things. I was just, you know, me and Sunny were talking just the other day or before lockdown about like, wow, I feel like our ball screen coverage is the tightest it's been yet mm. and i think that is because we had the opportunity to sit down with zico mm. uh, and we actually got to more learn about um the offensive side of things from him and how to kind of um exploit different coverages but in turn that teaching allowed us to figure out how we would take away those <laughs> <laughs> um so definitely uh i would say just yeah just picking bits and pieces up like even just watching Daryl Cartwright teach the hard show um, was really beneficial. Um, I remember Tab Baldwin came over a few, um, maybe last year, and he came to practice because he was looking at some Filipino guys. He was looking at my Filipino guys at practice, and then we just started chatting, and he started sharing a very different philosophy in terms of in terms of sending the ball baseline and having help rotation already kind of ready to step up and um that's something that i explored um a lot last year with my harbor team um that we actually utilized a little bit in the u.s at times mm-hmm. um so yeah i would say just being really um open and seeking different ideas mm-hmm. um i think that's really important um but I, I guess if I can, I just think if there's one thing that I really think is important overall from, from the conversation, even just kind of, it's, I was going to say at the start, like it's so good to do this for me personally. Like it is a little bit like weird because I don't, um, I don't talk about stuff that often, at least in this type of forum. Sure. Um, but it's been so good because it's made me think about Um, what we do and why we do it and then having to document that and then think of how I would explain it to someone else going through that process has been really beneficial and going through that process I think 
if there's one takeaway that I have come out of it is really understanding why you're doing stuff. Mm. I just think back to the start and I did a whole bunch of crap, but there was no clear intention behind it. Mm. What types of players am I trying to build? You know what I mean? Like, where is this going to lead them? How is this going to help them? Mm -hmm. Um, What do they need to know? And so I think that once you can start answering that question to whatever you're running right now with your team, you'll know whether it is the right thing to do or whether you need to maybe think outside the box. Um, And so, yeah, I suppose that that would be, I don't even know if I answered your question, but I just went on a little side rant there. Um, what, what about some um, resources that you maybe would, would encourage people to look at just from a philosophy building and or defensive um, kind of thinking? Any, any mm. in particular, or is it really just kind of if you go to people and ask them yeah. to explain things for you that maybe it's not so much yeah. like a website or an article? Or I'm probably not the best because um, <laughs> because a lot of my stuff is through conversations. Yeah, cool. um, But I will actually chuck a couple of things up on the chat, some videos that I've found really, really beneficial. One that comes to mind is um, there's an Aussie lady that that taught um, the one to two half court trap, which is what I teach. Mm. Um, And I thought that she was just fantastic at it was a great way of, again, just an example of how to layer your teaching. Um, So I might chuck that in. Um, and a few other things that I think about, but I don't have necessarily like, um, sources, although I would say, um, the one type of thing that I have been watching lately is, is the series of, um, podcasts or YouTube series that Wyndham basketball have been sharing online. And there's been a few New Zealand coaches on there, um, Mal down. And I think Pete Van something from, from Canterbury, um, Hassel, I think it is. Um, so those are really helpful too. So, um, that's what I've been watching, but I'll put some thought to that. Cool. Yeah. So I think we'll maybe wrap up, wrap up, um, unless someone has another question. Um, I, I think that, um, I think one of the major takeaways, and I would say maybe encouragements, um, a number one, if you haven't had a chance, look, look at the document that we've added to the event, um, that really both in terms of what Matt's written out, um, articulating his philosophy, but then also Matt's completed the template. Um, And I think the template is really nice because I I think that it's really valuable right now to reflect on the linkages between everything. So what's the relationship between, you know, the kind of style we want to play, um, the core principles um, and and the specific techniques and situational specific reads that we do. There should be an alignment between all of those things. Um, mm. I put in a, an image into the post um, of the beliefs tree, which I think is is actually a really good way of of kind of capturing that concept. You know, like your worldview and your value system is the trunk of the tree. Um, that's your root. That's that's what holds you stable. Um, and the trees and the leaves, those things change, um, mm-hmm. because those are the things that depend on context and players and time of season and game, but, but you got to have some really sort of what's anchoring you down defensively. And I think it's pretty clear that Matt, you know, you really believe in having very tough, hardworking, um, you know, fit players who, uh, bring it every single possession, every single game. And then that filters into a whole kind of belief system around what well, we, we play up we hard show, um, we play in the full court, we don't just play in the half court, you know, we don't rely on help, we want you to guard the ball. Um, and, and I think those things show themselves very, very much. I think it'll be cool in our next chat to talk about what that looks like in training, mm. how we approach that in training, um, yeah. you know, some of your favorite drills, some of your favorite um, things to do in, a, in, in terms of how you progress your team through the season, what does early yeah. season, mid-season, late season look like? So I think that'd be really, really valuable to kind yeah. of take that next step. Um, I'd really like to see us as a, as a club take that next leap defensively. I feel like we've started to make a lot of really good yeah. um, things happen offensively but I really would like to see the defensive side take a big level up. And I think this goes a long way towards helping. It's already changed my thinking a ton. Um, So really, really helpful. Cool. Sounds good. Anyone else got a comment or uh, just thumbs up if you're good? Sweet. Awesome. 
Um, so I guess what I will do, I would encourage you to maybe reflect on the template that's Matt sent out. Um, I think let me do the next one. We might have a little bit of um, a breakout style at the, at the beginning, just to have a chance to reflect on this conversation, the documents that we've sent out and just have a chat. Um, um, maybe more, maybe a bit more interactive, um, but bring your questions for the next one um, and reach out to me if you have any thoughts or questions about anything. Cool. Awesome. Sweet. All right, guys. Thank you, Matt. No problem. Uh, and uh, yep, yeah, let's um, see you guys on Tuesday uh, for who, for those who can join. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. Thanks. Here, guys.